to change in rural Colorado, economic innovation and resiliency in the COVID era. Colorado Humanities and Colorado State University's Regional Economic Development Institute have joined forces to develop the Change in Rural Colorado Discussion Series. I grew up in rural upstate New York. I rode a school bus. The bookmobile came to the end of our road every few weeks. We had a volunteer fire department. Sometimes we felt the bonds of community and sometimes we felt isolated from life in the nearby towns. I now live in a rural Colorado County, which is in the midst of great change. Some changes that bring a better quality of life and some that bump up against rural qualities and values. I'm looking forward to learning from our panelists tonight and hearing from all of you as we examine and discuss the challenges and opportunities in rural Colorado. I'd like to thank Dr. Don Thilmeny and Dr. Stefan Weiler for embracing this idea uh, for a program on rural Colorado. And thanks to the Colorado Humanities Board and staff members, Gina Hewitt, Josephine Jones, Nora Ridgeway, and Chris Goff. Thanks also to the National Endowment for the Humanities for financial support. Our moderator tonight is Dr. Don Thilmeny. Dr. Thilmeny is Professor of Agricultural Economics, Co-Director of the Regional Economic Development Institute, and Director of Engaged Research at Colorado State University. She specializes in rural economic development with a focus on food supply chains. Please welcome Dr. Thilmeny. Maggie, what a great way to start the program. Thank you very much for those opening mm -hmm. remarks. And we were just as pleased to be invited to be a part of this collaboration with you. Um, we do want to start today by just reminding you all that we have chosen to record this program because there's many people who wanted to be a part of tonight's program and it didn't fit their schedule. So we want to um, make sure you all understand both being in attendance and if you ask questions and answers at the end when we give a chance, that it also implies that you're, you're okay with the fact that those, those interactions will be recorded so that we um, give you full um, information on that. So with that, let's start with our program. And what makes this program so wonderfully unique and rich is we got a really good set of speakers. We were really fortunate. We didn't have a single one of them say no to us. So let me introduce them to you quickly. Um, the first person you'll be hearing from tonight is Elizabeth Garner, who is the state demographer for Colorado, which is housed in the Department of Local Affairs, which is the agency focused on strengthening the capacity of Colorado's communities. For over 25 years, Elizabeth has researched and discussed Colorado's population trends and their impacts, including aging in Colorado, characteristics of migration, and Census 2020. Elizabeth is an economist and received her BA in business at the University of San Diego and her master's in agricultural and resource economics right here at Colorado State University. She was born and raised in Colorado, something only 43% of the state's population can say. And on a personal note, she's one of the very first people I met when I moved here to be a professor 23 years ago. So um, I'm always excited to get a welcome her to a program. Next, you'll be hearing from um, my co-host tonight from CSU, Dr. Stefan Weiler. Um, he is a professor of economics at Colorado State and co-director of the university's Regional Economic Development Institute. His current work focuses on regional economic growth and development, particularly in rural and inner city areas combining theoretical, empirical, and policy analysis on topics as wide ranging as information, innovation, industrial restructuring, land use, public private partnerships, entrepreneurship, gender, and the environment. He received his BA with honors in economics and MA in development economics from Stanford University in 1988, finishing with his economics PhD from Berkeley in 1994. Next, we'll be hearing from two of our partners from the Office of Economic Development um, and International Trade. Kat Papenbrock is the Rural Opportunity Representative for the Western Slope of Colorado for the Office of Economic Development and International Trade, I often call it OEDIC, 
where she represents, oversees, and executes projects to advance Colorado's rural communities. This work includes managing the Rural Technical Assistance Program, coordinating rural strategy for the respective regions, working with OEDIT offices, including the Small Business Development Center, Minority Business Office, and the Employee Ownership Network. Prior to joining OEDIT, Hoppenbrock served as the Executive Director for the URA Tourism Office, and during her tenure, she and her team restructured their destination marketing management and development programs and successfully participated in several regional destination marketing programs. She's a passionate advocate for the quality of life, recreation opportunities, incredible food and entrepreneurial spirit of Colorado's West Slope and we're happy to have her on the program. She's joined tonight by her colleague, um, Greg Tomlinson, who we'll also hear from and both of them bring some really interesting projects and case studies to discuss. Greg has established collaborative partnerships across key government, industry, and high education offices in the process of building sustainable economic development opportunities. He currently serves as the Rural Opportunity Representative for Eastern Colorado with OEDIT. Prior to joining OEDIT, Greg was the Executive Director at Morgan County Economic Development Corporation, where he advocated for workforce, housing, new business development, and cultural inclusion. Last but not least, we'll be hearing from another one of our Ready Associates here at Colorado State University, Dr. Michael Seaman. He's an assistant professor of arts management at Colorado State University, and his work examines issues in the creative economy and often focuses on how music ecosystems and regional growth intersect. The New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, National Public Radio, and many regional media outlets often seek Michael's perspective and insights. His work is published in various academic journals, edited volumes, City Lab, and most recently with Brookings Institution. He's also co-authored music strategies and creative economy reports for the city of Denver and the state of Colorado. So uh, that said, you can see I have a rich set of human uh, resources here to share their knowledge and opinions with you. And for that, I'm gonna turn it over to Elizabeth Barner to begin. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Dawn, so much for uh, including me and in, in the introduction, and I'm excited about uh, this session. So what I'm going to do is set some context in terms of what we see going on in the state and in the country and kind of where does rural Colorado fit into this big picture. Next slide. Some of the big key trends that we should keep aware of within the country, again, in Colorado that not just COVID, but big picture impacts are the fact that we're starting to grow at a slowing rate. So we're still growing, but it's slowing down. A lot of that has to do with the fact that we're seeing a slowdown in births as well as an increase in deaths. And again, this is pre-COVID. Concentrated growth along the I-25 corridor is something that's been impacting the state. And the fact that Colorado's aging, I'm sure everybody celebrated a birthday last year, and that impacts everything from the economy to housing to public finance, but especially growth. Migration is slowing down as well. So just the concept of mobility is slowing down within the country. And so it makes it that much harder to attract and retain the best and the brightest. And Colorado is a little bit more expensive. We're also becoming more racially and ethnically diverse and it's especially our young population that's aging into the labor force, as well as consumers, where we'll see some of these biggest changes. Next slide. This graph shows the change in Colorado since 1970. So the total bar shows the total population change. The red component is net migration. The blue component is natural increase, the burst minus deaths. And in 2020, Colorado reached 5.8 million people. It was the 12th fastest growing state at an increase of a 0.85, so below 1% growth rate and ninth in total growth, including, including increasing by 49,000, almost 50,000. But this was our slowest growth since the 80s. And you can see on the far right how much slower the growth has been basically since 2015. And that's important to recognize that we're starting to see this slowdown, not only in Colorado, but nationally, because these factors, migration, births, and deaths are changing. Next slide. If we look at the state as a whole and we look at the change since 2010 through 2019, because we don't have county data yet for 2020, we can see the red, orange, yellow counties are the counties that have been increasing in population. 
all of the shades of blue are counties that have been declining. So we've seen declines in population in about a third of the counties in Colorado, even though we're one of the faster growing states and have one of the better economies. Just last year, our increase was 67,000 compared to the increase this last year of 50,000. So important to see that. I wanna talk about some of that context behind it, but you'll see slowdown or declines a lot on the Eastern Plains, San Luis Valley and the Northwest part of the state. Next slide. So I had mentioned before natural decline or natural increase, uh, looking at that burst minus deaths. And we've got about 20% of the counties we've experienced, a, are experiencing a natural decline. That means that they've got more deaths than births occurring. Again, primarily concentrated in the San Luis Valley and the Southeast part of the state. But important to know that those counties are on a trajectory of decline unless we start to see any kind of migration into those counties. Next slide. And then this is the same concept for net migration. Again, the red, orange, yellow counties are counties that have been increasing in migration. And all of the shades of blue are counties that are experiencing out migration. Again, we're seeing the same pattern where a lot of rural Colorado and a lot of, again, the Eastern Plains, especially, we're starting to see this out migration, which is contrary to historical trends Historically, we've seen only about 83% of the growth along the I-25 corridor compared to this decade where we've actually seen 95%. Next slide. And it's all really very much correlated to job growth, which I know Stefan's gonna talk a little bit more about. When we look at the same concept in Colorado for job growth, the uh, front range and we're seeing the red, orange, yellow counties are counties that have seen a growth since the pre-recession peak. So this is the great recession back in the late 2000s, where these the red, orange, yellow, yellow counties are counties that are back to pre-recession peak levels of employment. And all of the shades of blue are not, which very much parallels total population change within the state. So we know that there's this huge correlation between job growth and population growth. Next slide. So aging, we're doing it all the time, right? And thank goodness, uh, it, it's important to celebrate those birthdays, but it impacts everything from your preferences to the type of housing that you want, to how you participate in the labor force, to how much money you make, as well as your service demands. Next slide. And this shows Colorado's age distribution by single year of age broken down by color by generation. The black line is at age 65 and a couple of things that you can see. One is that our peak person is 29 years old, right there at the end kind of of our millennials. We can also see that we see that downward slope on the far left-hand side, really showing that we've seen this slowdown in births. We've got our peak birth was in 2007, making them about 14 years old. But important to see this context because this is what's gonna be experiencing um, both the labor force as well as purchases throughout the state by those age groups. Next slide. So if we take this concept of what our current age is and we just project it 10 years forward to 2030, we can look at what age groups are gonna be growing the fastest and that might impact different parts of the state. For our young population, very little growth, uh, very little in the under 17, just a little bit in the 18 to 24 year olds, more in the 25 to 44, kind of our bread and butter for the state, our largest share of the population. Then we look at our 45 to 64, very little, and that impacts a lot because those tend to be our highest earners, but our most growth and our fastest growth will be in that 65 plus. And that makes a big difference because that really talks about our fastest growth and where do make, they make their expenditures, which tend to be in some of the industries like accommodations, food service, health services that have different impacts around the state. Next slide. It also impacts our labor force. And this slide of the map of the state is showing the grayed out counties are counties that are gonna be forecast, are forecast to actually have a decline in the working age population. So not only has rural Colorado been struggling maybe with just maintaining its population, it's also forecast to potentially lose a lot of its 
labor force or its primary working age population over this next decade. Next slide. We also wanna talk about diversity. Uh, as I've mentioned before, one of the things that Colorado is doing is growing its diversity and it's doing it by age. So this chart is showing Colorado's age distribution by our people of color. So what we can see is that our under 17, much larger share of the population are people of color, so about 43%, compared to our older population, 65 plus, that's only about 15%. Why does this matter? Well, it's our youngest population that's gonna be aging into the labor force, aging into our largest consumer base. So it's so important for us to understand that we are more diverse at our younger ages. And we can take that into account when we're looking at whether it's hiring practices, marketing practice, whatever it may be that we've got this diversity, but it is at our younger ages. Next slide. And if we look at a map across the state, this also talks about some opportunities. Um, the darkest colored blue is our parts of the state that have our highest concentration of people of color. And we can see that in the San Luis Valley, kind of the southeast part of the state, also in the Denver metro area, also along the I-70 corridor going west. And what's going to be important to remember is that then this is something that we can leverage when we're looking at growth, when we're looking at opportunities. A lot of our Younger population, again, is gonna be more diverse that we can attract into these labor force positions as well as into our consumer base. Next slide. Interesting is from this last decade, if we look at the growth just from 2010 to 2019 and we look at it by our age groups, the Hispanic population in Colorado has actually experienced some of the greatest growth in our under 18 population, which we can see on the chart as well as in our 18 to 64. So we've increased by you know, a little over 700,000 people over this time frame, and a large share of it has been in our Hispanic population, both in our youngest, as well as in this 18 to 64. Next slide. So what is our forecast for the state? Taking jobs and then the population and its dynamics into account. If we look from 2020 at about 5.8 million, forecast then to increase to about 7.9 million by 2050. Most of that growth we're forecasting along the I-25 corridor if nothing changes. And that's the whole point behind a lot of this, is this is based on current conditions today, forecast out into the future that if nothing changes, that we'll see this continued growth along the I-25 corridor. Um, and then very little growth kind of in that blue section of the state, uh, which is southeast part, um, a little bit more along the I-70 corridor going west. You can see Mesa County out there, kind of the anchor on our western slope. But then that's the forecast for the state as a whole with some of our counties losing population. Next slide. So how should you take this into account in thinking about Colorado and especially rural Colorado into the future? Couple of things is, is this last decade has been a little rough on some parts of rural Colorado, uh, primarily because we are starting to see this slowdown in population with the slower births, increasing deaths, as well as the slowdown in net migration to a lot of parts of the state, but very correlated to job growth. And that's really kind of the anchor in this. And I know that Stefan's gonna be talking about it more is, really looking at job growth in some of these anchor parts compared to then the front range part of Colorado, which we've seen a lot of growth in uh, healthcare, professional business services, accommodations, food services, really looking at the rural parts of the state and what are some of those key sectors that then could be some anchors. Also really important to take into account that we're aging and that we're getting older and that a lot of parts of Colorado are gonna be losing their primary working age population. So a lot of places we're talking to are like, how do you actually retain a population? Maybe not as much attract, but how do you retain all age groups as well as look at labor force participation rates for all age groups and get more people into that labor force across the state? Uh, also important to really take a look at 
that young population that will be our future labor force as well as consumers are also more racially and ethnically diverse. And it will be important to look at how we attract and retain a more diverse population across the state as well, because that will be the future to a lot of parts of our state. And last but not least is all, is to really understand this connection between the demographics, age, um, and then the economy and what's going on on that part. Next slide. So with that, I want to thank all of you. And then it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Stefan Weiler, who will be the next speaker. Thank you guys very much. Thanks very much, Elizabeth, for that really helpful content context. Uh, that what she talked about the demographics of innovation and resiliency, and I'm going to take a look at the economic side. Um, as, as Don mentioned at the beginning, I'm, my name is Stefan Weiler. I'm the co-director of the Regional Economic Development Institute at Colorado State University. Uh, you can find us on the web at ready.colostate.edu, but don't worry, I'll, you'll be sure to see that before the end of the presentation again. Next slide. Um, so rural areas are still rural areas are still pioneers. Um, that is one of the one of the themes that I um, want to highlight here is that I think we're having problems with the audio. Let me let me try this now. This hopefully this is better. Much better, uh, Stephanie. You're actually a little loud now. So thank you if you're willing to do it without your earphones. Absolutely, no, absolutely, whatever works best for the audience. So there's a lot of neglected parts. Of, usually the economics is the dismal science, but actually relative to uh, some of the sort of grimmer forecasts that uh, Elizabeth had for some of the rural areas, there's a real economic upside to rural Colorado. And and what we one, what we think about is rural areas is still being pioneers. So a couple, in a couple of different ways that I think are pretty remarkable. First of all, rural communities are remarkably entrepreneurial. Um, there's some farm legacy, but only one sixth of rural establishments are farms. Even accounting for ag, rural areas are more entrepreneurial. And cities are actually hugely surprised by this, is that tech startups, that tech startups are not the norm. Um, in fact, that rural areas really have them in terms of entrepreneurship, as I'll show momentarily. And as you folks, as most folks on this call know, rural areas have to be entrepreneurial because the big wage and salary employers are rare, like coal mines, like CSU, like IBM, like Google, which don't plunk themselves down in the middle of rural Colorado. So towns and residents have had to figure out their own ways to find their niche, what they're relatively good at, what they can sell to the rest of the world. And that niche might include the foreign born. The foreign born residents are actually twice as likely to become entrepreneurs as native born residents. Uh, and so that, and they are scattered, there are concentrations of foreign born residents scattered throughout Colorado. So that's a real opportunity. So rural communities are remarkably entrepreneurial, but maybe even more remarkable is that rural businesses are actually more resilient. And this, the, the gold standard for resiliency is the five year survival rate, basically. And most businesses, you don't get over that hump of the five-year survival. And we'll take a look at it over the Great Recession, which, which until COVID was the greatest downturn, economic downturn since the Great Depression. But as it turns out in any given year, up to 10% higher survival rates in rural areas. So the seedlings for growth in terms of entrepreneurs and the resiliency of those entrepreneurs, those seedlings of growth are already in your or neighboring communities. Next slide, please. So this is just a graph to demonstrate this, that entrepreneurship is more concentrated in more rural areas and more resilient too. So on the left-hand graph, we have non-farm proprietors, and those are basically business owners uh, per 100 residents. As you, and as you go from metropolitan areas, which are based on 50, cities of 50,000 or more, to micropolitan areas that are based on cities of between 10 to 50,000, and then rural areas that are based on towns of less than 10,000, you'll notice that what happens is that as you go from more urbanized areas to more rural areas, that the concentration of business owners grow. And that is particularly true in Colorado where rural areas have nearly 30 business owners per 100 residents, which is pretty remarkable and very high for the United States as, as a whole. On the right-hand side, we have the five-year business survival rate, which as I said, the gold standard for the resiliency of businesses. And we took a look from 2004, which was well before the Great Recession, and to 2011, which was well be after it. And you'll notice once again, that as you go from more urbanized metropolitan areas to micropolitan areas to rural areas, that five, the five-year business survival rate, the resiliency of those businesses goes up. 
Now, Colorado lags the United States a little bit, but that's not as problematic as, as, as you might think, and we'll talk about that momentarily. Next slide. So who are these entrepreneurs? As it turns out, most of them are gigs. And most people thought that gigs just showed up in the last decade or so, but that's not true. Gigs, uh, gigs are not just Uber, um, but stylists, lawyers, construction workers, real estate agents, those folks who are sole entrepreneurs, sole proprietors, sole business owners, working for themselves, self-employed, they represent three quarters, three quarters, 75% of all US businesses are basically the self-employed. So, which is pretty remarkable. And when you take a look at this 20 year snapshot between 1997 and 2017, what you'll notice is that these non-employers, these gig workers who don't employ anybody have been growing much faster than their counterparts. So if you take a look at the solid lines, blue for Colorado, red for the United States, they are growing over twice as fast as the, as the, as the employer uh, establishments, um, which we usually think of, those are the CSUs, the IBMs, the Googles, the people that actually hire people. But those folks only represent 25% of, of businesses. Again, gigs are the ones that are really driving the growth. Next slide, please. So these pioneers, these gig workers are, are the ones who really guide growth forward. So gig non-employers, about 20% of them become employers as they grow. So if you're running a business on your own and you, you, have, you have success and you can't manage anymore just working on your own, you start hiring workers. And fully one third of job creation comes from hiring your first, second, or third worker, which is really huge when you think about it. It's not the Googles, the IBMs, the large companies in the world that are creating many of the jobs. A lot of it is coming from these really small companies that are starting to hire workers. But we, as we know that some of them won't survive, that closures um, of businesses create one third of job losses. But that's really two sides of the same coin. The job creation comes with job losses, that, hi that hirings and firings, um, and openings of uh, businesses and closures of businesses, those again are two sides of the same coin. And the idea is that the more openings and more closings that you get, re represent a highly dynamic, churning, pioneering economy that are trying new things constantly, that are pushing, pushing the frontier. Um, and that dynamism creates long-term job growth, particularly in Colorado. Colorado has been a particularly good case of this over the last 30 years, um, which has had phenomenal job growth, which is part of the reason we've attracted as Elizabeth pointed out, a lot of people to the front range in particular. So the, the reason why this, this works this way is that what doesn't work is as important as what does. What doesn't work when you have a closure or layoff suggests that that's not a path that other people want to follow. But what does work when you have openings or expansions, that's the greener pastures where, where, where other people can actually take a look um, also for economic success. And you can think of the economy as a seed bed with entrepreneurs as seeds. If you have more seeds, so more openings and more businesses, you're going to have more duds. There's going to be, some of them aren't going to survive and some of them are going to close, but there, you have a better odds for a Google. And that's what really drives the idea of long-term job growth with this dynamism, openings and closings. Entrepreneurs are conduits for innovation. That's part of the reason that they're really important. And failure is part of becoming a dynamic economy. And I grew up and went to school, as you might, might remember from Don's introduction, in the Bay Area during the heady 70s and 80s, um, when growth was really, was really beginning to accelerate. And the mantra in, in the Silicon Valley is fail first, fail fast, fail often. And the idea is if you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. You're not pushing the frontier hard enough. So the question is, how do you get to keep these entrepreneurs? Next slide. The reason we were concerned about keeping these entrepreneurs is again, that they're conduits of innovation. And economists define and track innovation as a product process or service that generates new value in the marketplace. So you have to start with, you have talented people coming up with new ideas and then meshing with capital, whether it be venture capital, it might be a small business loan, it could be your credit card. But that, that yields raw innovations. And raw innovations run the gamut from you know, a new idea for a new restaurant to a lab at CSU that creates a new battery. But those innovators aren't enough because what they, what they need to get to the marketplace are entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial business models to refine raw innovations, to identify, create, maximize, and the market niche and value to basically mold those innovations for the marketplace, whether it be regional, national, and or international. Next slide. So we think these entrepreneurs are important for job growth and for overall economic vitality. So how do we get and keep these folks? Well, what part of the trick is that that is again where small towns can, can be really attractive. 
entrepreneurship is often lost in cities because they're big, they're complicated, but it, entrepreneurs can have real tangible impacts in smaller towns. Just having one or two entrepreneurs opening a storefront in a rural town can really revive a main street. Amenities matter. Amenities are basically nice things like both and good people basically like nice places. And we talk about amenities both in terms of nature and natural amenities as well as cultural amenities. In Colorado, we're fortunate to have a lot of natural amenities, hills and mountains and lakes and rivers. But we also have a lot of history and a lot of culture. And that's something that Michael Seaman is going to talk about when he talks about the creative economy. We usually think about these aspects as attracting tourists, but actually they're just as important, if not more so, in attracting and retaining permanent residents. And when I think about these kind of, uh, when I think about these kind of situations, I think about the Salida's Creative District. And Salida's Creative District has a lot of artist studios, uh, artist galleries, a brew pub, a distillery. But then you have the Arkansas River right in your, out your back door where you can go rafting in the summer. You've got the Collegiates where you can go hiking in the summer. And then in the winter, you've got Monarch and Crested Butte nearby to ski. So those are it, these are combinations of natural and cultural amenities, which may be which may be in fact your niche. That might be what you're relatively good at. And so the idea is to emphasize your niche in the marketplace, what you're relatively good at. And the fact is it's already likely there. There are entrepreneurs already working on your niche. Now, one term that gets bandied around a bunch and something that I talked to Elizabeth about a lot is the low, what you, known as new, new, location neutral businesses and employees. And that's just a fancy word for remote work. And location neutral simply means that you that people can work anywhere for anyone anywhere else. Um, and COVID in some ways has been a key factor in that. Now, COVID has been a tragedy. It's been obviously a huge economic downturn, but it's also had a huge human cost. We have, we're now over 500,000 people in the United States that have lost their lives. But COVID has also pushed our economy forward faster than we, I think, were ready to experience. Um, people always talked about teleconferencing, but uh, rarely used it. People still went constantly traveling. Business travel you know, was regular. And, but what happened with COVID is that we had to do, turn to technology. We had to turn to telework. And as it turns out, you know, for example, evenings like this, COVID has shown that telework does work. Um, that that it, that it does allow remote workers to re to work remotely and to, to displace themselves potentially from the high cost areas like San Francisco and the East Coast, and that's a key for uh, small towns because now people are beginning to take a look. You're hearing about people from San Francisco and the Silicon Valley leaving for Boise, leaving for the leaving for the Western Slope. Um, because the internet now can make any small town relatively attractive locations for t for telework and remote work, and those are uh, those are examples I believe that uh, Kat and Greg are going to talk about, um, which to whom, to whom I'm going to turn it over here momentarily. But first, uh, next slide. I want to thank you all, from all of us at Ready at CSU for being here tonight. To learn more about us, you're welcome to visit our website, ready.colostate.edu, where you can also take a look at um, our COVID-19 responses, as well as our larger Ready team. So thanks very much from Ready at CSU for this opportunity. Greg and Kat. Thank you. I'm pleased to have, along with my coworker, Kat Pappenbrock, the opportunity to provide you the following insights into the innovative approaches some of Colorado's rural communities have taken to build greater resiliency in their local economies. Next. Next slide. Thank you. No matter the size of your community, every economic developer should continually work to ensure that the following economic priorities are addressed. Education and training, economic diversification, the creation of community amenities, and building support for entrepreneurship, along with laser-focused community development, including transportation, housing, childcare, healthcare, and broadband, plus a collaborative spirit that involves public, nonprofit, and private sectors. Next, I'll have Kat uh, provide you some insights on case studies that she's uh, familiar with. Greg, um, I'm going to start over in my region, the Western Slope of Colorado, with the West End of Montrose County. So we're almost into Utah. Um, the West End Economic Development Corporation was founded in 2013 to create and encourage, as traditional economic development corporations do, a friendly pro-business environment. 
They've also had the unique challenge of supporting the small communities of Nucla and Natarita with their major industry transition. The closing of the area's primary employer, Tri-State's coal-fired power plant and coal mine, which were slated to close in 2022, but actually completed their closures at, by the end of 2019. In dealing with this transition, Weed Sea was actually able to leverage a unique partnership in this region, the Telluride Foundation, who stepped in to play an active role in supporting their capacity as well as the industry transition. Now, the Telluride Foundation is unique in its philanthropic giving in that it has a slate of donors who want to see their money put to use right now on needed projects rather than building sort of a long-term endowment fund. So through that support, the Telluride Foundation supported key staff positions um, and also helped Weed Sea receive an $800,000 Economic Development Administration grant to help to continue to diversify the economy through value-added agriculture, outdoor recreation and tourism, and business and entrepreneurship. That grant was matched by their other regional partners, um, both the municipalities all the way up to the Economic Development District of Region 10. This program has been effective um, since basically being implemented in 2018 and really impactful. Since then, they've opened over 20 new businesses between Nucla and Natarita, five of which were coming out of former coal transition employees. They're, they've also doubled down on small business services. Their small business development counselor there represents 12% of all counseling sessions for our entire six county region, which is amazing. They've also had some large projects like a new grain mill in Norwood that utilizes locally grown heritage grains, um, as well as opening and refurbishing the collective mine, which is a proximity network co-working space that's now fully leased and also includes a commissary kitchen. They certainly have challenges moving forward. Once the EDA grant ends, they'll have some capacity issues to continue to support their staff, but the strong network of partners that they've created will certainly help them as well as a long-term sustainability plan that they just completed in the last year. So back to you, Greg, for the next one. Thank you. In 2016, the city of Brush identified the need to redevelop an abandoned 84 acre feedlot located on the outskirts of the city. The city purchased the land, conducted the cleanup using city staff, and started the process of annex annexing the land into the city with the goal of creating the Brush Agri Park. The city also created a master plan using existing staff, which the city manager states probably uh, placed the cost of that uh, master plan at about $10, the cost of paper. They then went ahead and uh, received two Rural Economic Development Initiative grants uh, from the uh, Department of Local Affairs to offset costs for water lines and upgrading the electrical service to the property. Word of the city's plan for redeveloping uh, the Agri Park reached the principal investors at Colorado Land Processing, LLC, a newly formed partnership that was looking for property in Weld County, adjacent to Morgan County, where uh, they finally landed. After reviewing the incentive package offered by the City of Brush and conducting an analysis on the savings in labor and utility costs, Colorado Land Processing purchased 23 acres in this 84-acre agri-park. The plant opened in the spring of 2018 and currently employs between 45 and 55 full-time employees and once fully staffed at about 75 to 100 employees will become the largest lamb processing plant in the US. Kat, back to you. Great, thank you. So next up, we're down into the San Luis Valley of Colorado with the uh, small town of Del Norte, population 1700, elevation 7800. So super close to my home of, uh, of Uray. Um, like most small mountain towns, they struggle to keep their youth after they graduate from high school, to find and keep sustainable businesses, and to not slowly disappear into the 21st century. They're in a stunning location with the Sangre de Cristo Mountains on the east and the San Juan Mountains on the west. And they're a great case study of how positive changes take time and a consistent vision. Just over 15 years ago, they listed their three core assets and realized they didn't own any of them. U.S. Highway 160 going east and west through the middle of town, the iconic Rio Grande, which is the northern town boundary, and over 2 million acres of federal lands. So with the help of a great Outdoors Colorado grant, and this is a grant program through the Colorado Lottery, Marty and Bonnie Asplin of Upper Rio Grande Economic Development created a master plan around leveraging those natural assets and bringing them home, so to speak, to benefit Del Norte. 
They created a 200 acre mountain park at Lookout Mountain, built mountain biking trails using IMBA standards in a unique partnership with federal land managers and recreation managers. This was a proof of concept project for all of the partners and it was received well by the town, by the land managers, as well as by the recreational users. As their recreation reputation continued to grow, they doubled down on it to connect key trail systems and as well as the climbing area of Penitente Canyon. And they leveraged massive partnerships too, the Volunteers for Outdoor Colorado, the Southwest Conservation Corps, and Veterans Green Jobs, which assists returning social soldiers from Afghanistan and Iraq in completing a smooth and successful transition back into the society. They were also able to install a unique playway feature on the Rio Grande that also includes a fish ladder and several fish habitat structures just upstream. Over the course of 15 years, these slow and steady investments, all building off of that original master plan, resulted in more than just new visitors. Rio Grande County went from one restaurant and a food counter in the gas station to eight restaurants, a microbrewery, an organic grocery, new houses on lots that have been empty since they were platted in 1872, as well as a new K through 12 school program providing STEM options that their youth never had before. They continue to move forward strategically. Their newest project is a community focused initiative that's working with the Institute for the Built Environment from CSU to finalize the designs for a four acre wellness village on land donated to their local hospital. Back to Greg. Thank you. Conceived in the spring of 2016 over coffee, the uh, Tech Start program in uh, Fountain uh, provides a case study on how a community can set itself up for future success by bringing together civic and community members to redefine the community's strengths and purpose. The uh, vision of Fremont Economic Development Corporation uh, is that Tech Start is now an innovation catalyst for rural Colorado. Today, tech start programs drive uh, startup tech companies as well as offering significant opportunities to those who, attempt, who are attempting to start tech businesses, network with other tech companies and build, a, uh, build and grow uh, with one another. The facility has become both an incubator as well as attraction for new and first stage uh, tech companies in Canyon City, as well as a remote work hub that is now attracting 10 uh, technology partners, including uh, PolicyPAC, VMblog, PAX8, and IGEL. This is truly a uh, example of what a community can do when they come together and look at other ways to identify their strengths and opportunities. Cat. Great. So next up is uh, is Chafee County. So we'll be looking at economic development as well as COVID impacts through the lens of a tourism impacted community. So Chafee County has always been a leader in rural tourism development and marketing, probably for the past decade. We all know about their beautiful Colorado assets between the Collegiate Peaks and the Arkansas River and the one of the original Colorado creative districts in Salida. They've also been an enthusiastic partner with OED at technical assistance programs. And the project I'm talking about today is actually a recipient of one of the Colorado Tourism Office's major marketing grants for this year. Like everyone, Chafee County saw major impacts from COVID. Early on, they shifted their visitor focused messaging to actually assisting their public health department and local businesses with their messaging needs, getting the word out on closures, restrictions, new, then eventually new operating hours, they help businesses get online and then message to visitors eventually how to safely visit. The tourism office was a connecting force for the individual communities within Chafee County and provided a united front for that delicate balance of community safety and economic viability. Since last March, they observed two distinct trends. First, more people than ever were taking advantage of Chafee County's public lands and they recognized an overwhelming need to educate visitors on responsible recreation. And second, their local small businesses, even though their public lands were full, the businesses saw a dramatic loss in sales. Chafee County is one of those rural communities and counties that relies on tourism to support almost all of their small businesses. So in an effort to drive economic impact during the ongoing pandemic and keep Colorado beautiful, they're encouraging visitors to take a localized adventure by nature pledge and then incentivizing folks to take this responsible tourism pledge by gifting them a free discovery pass that incentivizes them to spend locally. So the Adventure by Nature Pledge teaches people how to responsibly recreate in the area in line with um, the Care for Colorado campaign that the Colorado Tourism Office does. 
Um, and then the Discovery Pass is a local digital savings pass that gets you over $600 in incentives both in the summer and winter from communities all throughout Chaffee County. That's Salida, Buena Vista, Plancha Springs, as well as Nathra. It's completely digital, so no paper, and it's used exclusively on a smartphone. Um, in the year of COVID, where destinations realized that they needed to change messaging constantly and efficiently, and businesses were challenged to get those changing hours or occupancy messaging out, the digital nature of this local discovery pass allows them to pivot, allows Chaffee County to pivot offers and push additional options to the platform within a matter of minutes. This helps diverse visitors across the county, continues to underscore their responsible messaging, and links the economic well-being of their businesses with the protection of their beautiful region. Located on uh, Colorado's Eastern Plains, Fort Morgan, Colorado is the second most diverse city in the state of Colorado with 25 different dialects spoken in the community. As director for Morgan County Economic Development Corporation, I recognize the opportunity that uh, such a diverse population represents. And I started conversations with uh, community leaders uh, about launching uh, uh, the potential for launching new businesses uh, utilizing this asset. As Stefan has already stated, uh, studies have shown that foreign born residents are twice as likely to wanna to start and operate their own businesses when compared to US born residents. I also recognize the cultural and language barriers that foreign born residents confront when interacting with banks, state and local government offices and negotiating building leases. During a monthly meeting of community and business leaders, I proposed that we establish a program that would assist foreign born residents in fulfilling their aspirations in becoming business owners. This launch took three years and of fact finding and discussions with local and state and nonprofit uh, entities. Those discussions led us from thinking in terms of sponsoring a yearly weekend retreat to having the community college step up and embed this certification program into their business entrepreneurship program. With a grant from the Colorado Health Foundation, MCC was able to hire two full-time business instructors, one who speaks Spanish and another who speaks Aromo, the most widely spoken of Somali dialects. These instructors will also serve as business mentors to every student who goes on to launch their own business. This past summer, the program launched with nine registered students. And as of the fall semester, enrollment had grown to 27 students, 22 of whom were Somalians and five of whom uh, related to, uh, or were Latinx. So as you can see, the progress that Morgan Community College has been able to make is uh, quite earth, uh, earthbreaking and uh, represents how a community can come together and utilize their uh, diverse population to uh, both attract and create new businesses. Next slide. The Colorado Creative Districts program certifies communities that contribute to the state's economy through creativity, culture, and the arts. 26 communities have earned the Creative District designation since the program was launched in 2017. All but one of these communities is located along I, uh, Colorado's I-25 Front Range Corridor and to the west in Colorado's scenic mountain and western slope regions. Sterling, Colorado is that exception and is located on Colorado's eastern plains. Sterling was fortunate to have an artist co-op that in 2017 sought a space to create grant to renovate the building that it occupied. The conversations that ensued would later lead to the formation of the local Logan County Arts League. The Arts League subsequently gained the support of the chamber, city and county governments and County Economic Development Corporation not to mention local artisans, and submitted an application to the Colorado Creative Industries, a division of the Colorado Office of Economic Development and International Trade, to become a certified Colorado Creative District. The city has designated a creative district 
uh, was designated a creative district in December of 2019, just ahead of the pandemic. The state's current 26 districts are eligible to access technical and professional assistance, increased visibility, two highway signs placed on state highways uh, near the districts, access to statewide economic data on the impact of creative districts, access to the Western States Arts Federation Creative Vitality Suite, and a year after certification, districts can apply for technical and professional assistance grants. As the city of Ster Sterling demonstrates, creative districts are not just for high volume tourist destinations and benefits of promoting your creative uh, community can lead to a better quality of life, marketing cachet, and a culture that attracts tourists, new residents, and encourages new business development. And that's all I have. So I'd like to uh, turn this over to Michael Seaman. Thank you. Hello. Yes. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, I'm honored to be with uh, the rest of the panelists, and it's great to virtually meet all of you in the audience, and I hope we can get to talk later. Uh, what I'd like to do today is just talk briefly about the state's creative economy, uh, where it's been where, and where it uh, may be going. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so before the pandemic happened, I was uh, assigned to really uh, examine the scale and scope of the creative economy of the state of Colorado. And if you're looking at the creative industries, uh, it was very, very robust. Uh, you had about 191,000 jobs, which is about 5% uh, of overall jobs in the state. Uh, sales of goods and services, like sales revenues, is about $31.6 billion, which is about 4% of the state's overall sales of goods and services. So it was a really robust, strong, going in the right direction. Uh, and if you look, in, uh, I separate things into nine sectors. And uh, most of the employment, uh, by far, is in music, theater, dance, and the visual arts. And a lot of this actually is really focused on music and uh, live music, the hosting of shows, the promotion of shows, uh, and that will come into play a little bit later. But as you can see, there's thousands of jobs within all of the sectors. Now, let's take a look at the job growth. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, so the employment growth within the creative industries from 2010 to 2019 is robust. Uh, this is also nationwide, but in Colorado, it uh, even outstripped uh, some of the uh, sectors across the nation in this time period. Uh, by far, you know, the, the leading growth was in uh, the culinary arts. And a lot of this is uh, really propelled by craft beer, distilleries, uh, wine that was coming up, but also local food entrepreneurs uh, and, and things like artisan uh, uh, um, items, but also things like beef jerky. Uh, there's a lot of food entrepreneurship uh, throughout the state. Uh, now, again, music, theater, dance, visual arts, uh, Again, the, the powerhouse of the Colorado creative economy, a uh, 35% growth, uh, trailing the 75% growth. But still, when you're talking about uh, employment growth within a state, uh, when you start getting in double digits, that's fantastic. Uh, everything, if you look, all nine of the um, uh, segments were growing. Uh, only publishing had a negative growth, but that's really more of a reflection of uh, the entire digital transformation within the creative economy. And a lot of these jobs actually uh, bubbled up again in creative technology, which looks at things like um, uh, social media, news uh, formats that are now online, online gaming, things like that. But this is the interesting thing about Colorado. Let's look at the next slide and see how does this play out spatially? Well, the important thing is the creative economy in Colorado is not just an urban phenomenon. You know, usually you think New York, Los Angeles, Seattle, big cities, but quite honestly, uh, it's all over the state. Uh, the creative economy is urban and rural in Colorado, and that's a huge strength. Uh, if you look at uh, spatially, of course, the Front Range, you know, the most populous region and really the economic driver of the entire state, does have a large percentage of the jobs uh, within the creative economy with the state and a percentage of change as well. 
But if you look at the entire state, the jobs are also in the Western Slope. Jobs are also in the Eastern Plains. Uh, again, it's statewide. And the statewide growth is a uh, 25%, which is fantastic. Now let's look at closer at the uh, Western Slope and the Eastern Plains, and we can see uh, what sectors are really thriving. Uh, next slide, please. So on the Western Slope, uh, you have, well, actually, to be honest, Western Slope and the Eastern Plains, uh, again, music, theater, dance, the visual arts, uh, performing arts, really that's where the jobs are concentrated uh, for the entire state and definitely on the Western and Eastern sides of the state. Uh, close behind, the culinary arts. Again, uh, craft beer is not just an urban thing. It is all over the state and you know, we've become the Silicon Valley uh, version of this. Let's look at the sales of goods and services. We'll go to the next slide for that. Uh, the creative economy, it's not a pocket change. Uh, as you can see, uh, it's, uh, we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, and this, again, we're not just talking about uh, the front range. If the Western Slope on top, the Eastern Plains on the bottom, uh, you're looking at, uh, in the Northwest, music, theater, dance, and visual arts, over $300 million in sales revenues. Um, even in uh, the Eastern Plains, which are, you know, much less populated, we're still talking about millions of dollars. Um, now, this is where it's a little different. Uh, you have uh, the culinary arts leading in most sectors, uh, most uh, regions within the West and the East. Uh, music, theater, and visual, dance, and visual arts also making a strong play. Uh, so again, it's not only spatially uh, diverse, it's also uh, diverse within this, the, uh, the Eastern Plains and the Western Slope. So this is where we were before the global pandemic uh, breaks out. And very quickly, I was asked to estimate how is this going to affect our state? Uh, this was Governor Polis' task force. So let's look at the estimations. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. Unfortunately, it was uh, a crisis. Uh, you know, this is uh, the easiest, um, since the Great Depression, the easiest, the largest crisis in terms of economics for the, uh, the entire country, let alone the state of Colorado. Uh, I spent a lot of time uh, talking with people within the field, uh, looking at trends, looking at uh, different pieces of information that were coming out at the time, because again, this was, I was immediately asked in March uh, to project what would happen in the next couple of months. Uh, so it was... Uh, uh, a daunting experience. Uh, but the estimations were basically, uh, we would lose about 59,000 jobs, sales revenue of about $2.6 billion. Now this represents 31% of all employment in the creative economy uh, and 8% of annual sales revenue uh, gone between April 1st and July 31st. Uh, this is a crisis situation. Now keep in mind, um, these jobs include people that are laid off, people that are furloughed, temporary, permanent. So some of those jobs will come back. Uh, also in the creative economy, uh, many times you have one person who holds two or three jobs. Uh, in some cases, one person could have lost three jobs. So this is a fluid thing. Um, one uh, important point though is music, theater, dance, and the visual arts represented about 50% of all jobs lost and 31% of all sales revenue that was gone. Uh, basically, when you have live performance shut down, of which most of uh, the uh, concentration of this sector was, uh, it, it was, again, a crisis situation. And that's just for April 1st to July 31st. Now, granted, some of this employment has come back, but unfortunately, a large part of it has not. But if there is something we can look, kind of think about, I wouldn't say it's good news. There's no good news when you have a global pandemic, but let's look at uh, what may be coming next. Next slide. It's important to know that demography is destiny. This is the uh, population of, well, now we're back, no? Uh, yeah, here we go. Uh, this is the population of the United States. Uh, and if you look, about 51% of the population is millennial or Generation Z, uh, basically 38 years old or younger. That's 
51% of the entire country. Well, what we know about uh, millennials is they spend money differently, as we've talked about in the beginning of the presentation. One thing they were very interested in is that 78% of millennials choose to spend money on experiences rather than items. They are funding what we called uh, the experience economy. And this was a huge growing and impactful trend right before COVID, much the same as the fact that the creative economy was incredibly robust right before COVID. Another fact that's interesting is 72% of millennials before COVID wanted to spend even more money on live experiences, on concerts, on immersive art experiences, festivals. Well, if there's one thing that Colorado is great at, it is throwing a party, hosting a festival. Next slide, please. Colorado is a live event magnet. Uh, we have, uh, and this is for the entire nation, we have the infrastructure, we have the educated, highly skilled individuals that know how to promote and host live events. Uh, and we have live events almost year round. It's one of the few states I've ever been in where you're at a festival and it starts snowing and it's a feature, not a bug. Uh, when things, when the, uh, the pandemic finally starts to recede, vaccinations uh, happen, we realize how to come back online efficiently. I would argue, like the uh, end of the 1918 pandemic, you had the roaring 20s. Well, I suggest that we're gonna have the screaming 20s. The creative economy was extremely robust before the pandemic. Uh, live events, uh, music and otherwise, were at an all-time high in terms of ticket sales. Uh, this is going to come back in a fantastic manner once things are figured out. And Colorado is perfectly positioned to take advantage of this. And I would suggest too that not only should we just focus on live events in places where we have the infrastructure like the Western Slope, we have the space on the Eastern Plains, but also we have uh, other um, industries that are parallel that are also very ripe for more cross-pollination with things like uh, live music. And that would be the culinary arts. Uh, there, our outdoor recreation industry is very robust. You could even look at healthcare and think of how can we start to cross-pollinate these with uh, more live events with music and otherwise. Uh, it's also important to note that we have uh, Meow Wolf, which is a very popular uh, immersive art experience that is uh, poised to be a, not almost like a Disney sort of situation within Denver, but that could be leveraged to the rural areas. Uh, they already uh, have an event in Talos. Uh, they are located in Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, but they also have an event in Talos that is uh, very successful. There's no reason why we can't leverage Meow Wolf out into the Western Slope and uh, Eastern Plains. And one other thing to think of too, uh, we talk about this employment, these jobs. Uh, the important thing to note is that many jobs, occupations within the creative economy are self-employed. Uh, there's a high percentage of people that are, as uh, Stefan was saying, location neutral. Uh, we've all seen it, we're doing this right now. You know, we've all even we've promised the, uh, the remote workforce for, for ages and now, Due to COVID, we see it actually works. Uh, and there's a large number of people in the creative economy that are attracted, like Stefan had mentioned, to places uh, that have natural amenities. Well, in Colorado, we have these places with natural amenities, but we also have the same places with creative uh, and experience economy amenities. Uh, now's the time to start thinking, is this a way to repopulate some of these places? Because there will be some people that are going back to the office. Uh, cities aren't dead, offices won't be dead, but there is an entirely new avenue of remote working that just wasn't there before and is now. And again, Colorado is perfectly uh, positioned for this and our Western Slope and Eastern Plains are huge, huge resources we can capitalize on going forward. All right, back to you, Don. Thank you so much. And, and before we open up the Zoom session for a discussion with everybody, we did want to tell you that if you like tonight's discussion, um, this is first in the series and our next one will be in March. And 
the speakers we already have confirmed um, kind of show you what our next pivot is gonna be. So we're gonna to continue to look at change in Colorado, rural Colorado by looking at loving our land and particularly programming that's going on across the state. It so dovetails with what we've heard tonight about the importance of natural resources to rural Colorado from water to lands to conservation districts to, um, I don't think it was a single economic development concept we've heard tonight that didn't embed natural resources as a key part. So we want to invite you to that discussion in, in March. Um, you'll be receiving an email when you get the posting for tonight's recording about the details for that. But I just wanted to give you a preview of some of the speakers we'll be featuring in that discussion before we opened up the discussion for tonight. So um, you all are probably as impressed and amazed at the breadth and innovation of things going on in rural Colorado as I am after hearing from these speakers. And so as I've promised a long time, we're gonna turn this over to a question and answer for our panelists. And some of the things we just wanna remind you, you've heard about that are great ideas and catalysts for us to start talking about. So we're gonna open it up, put all of you on gallery view and open up the discussion. But to start off, because it was the by far most popular question of the night so far, how can you guys get this information? You just filled your brains at halfway through the hour. There's so many statistics, so many graphics. Um, we believe for sure we're gonna be getting you, uh, um, we can post the presentations from the tonight with the great um, audio overview that all of the speakers gave. In addition, if I get approval from all of the speakers, we'll make sure these slides are also available. So we will find a way to, to share that with you. Gina is gonna give you some of the details for next month's panel, but that's how we'll also end the evening. But for now, once we've told you that we in fact can get you all of this great data and the figures and the graphs and the maps, let's talk about what we can share um, um, in a conversation tonight. Now that you guys have hopefully been inspired by all these speakers, let's go to, if you, if you go up to your view and you see one of the icons is a myriad of boxes, let's go ahead and, unspotlight the speakers and put everybody on camera. And um, as long as it goes fairly smoothly, you are more than welcome to put your questions for these speakers in the chat box, but we are happy to let you unmute yourself and actually ask your question directly or share something that's going on in your community as well. And we have our first volunteer, which is Haley, who's with Representative Bacon. So feel free to um, unmute yourself, Haley, and ask a question to our panel. Thanks. Uh, my name's Haley. I'm a proud alum of Colorado State University. And now, yeah, I met my husband there in Clark C. Um, but uh, I'm now chief of staff for Representative Bacon. She's in House District 7, the far northeast of Denver. Um, but she considers herself as a representative for the whole state and not just her district. And in particular, she's wondering about how to support minority and women-owned businesses in rural Colorado. So I was wondering if you had any data that was around minority and women-owned businesses. Everyone on this panel probably can answer that. Who wants to go first? Yeah, Haley, this is Greg Thomason. And I don't have any hard data on women and uh, minority owned businesses uh, and how to support them uh, across the uh, rural Colorado. Uh, but I, I would just emphasize that Morgan Community College and the program that they adopted through uh, the community conversations really, I think, have approached this from a uh, perspective of not just introducing uh, minority populations to the opportunities that uh, business ownership uh, offers, but also providing them with the mentorship that many individuals who are going into uh, a business uh, for the first time uh, can value and, and, and benefit from. Uh, studies have shown that uh, mentorship can improve uh, the chances of uh, success for a first time business owner by 80%. So I think, you know, from my perspective, anyway, that's, that's key to uh, helping both women and minority owned business uh, uh, businesses. 
Yeah, this is Stefan. Uh, uh, women and, and minority entrepreneurs, I mean, they're, they are really well represented in the gig economy. Um, and uh, the, the problem is that they have a harder time turning themselves into employers. So they end up getting somewhat stuck because of capital constraints, for instance, that they uh, that they aren't as easy to get bank loans for, for instance. And so one of the things, one of the projects we're working on is seeing about how to get a better conduit for people who are doing gigs to actually start hiring workers as they as they expand. Well, and as Azar, Azarel, if I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing your name close to correctly, do you, your your question and comment are perfectly framed for this discussion. So. Do you want to unmute yourself and, and share that um, idea and resource yourself or just have people read it in the chat box? Um, yeah, definitely. If I may have a minute to, to discuss it. Um, so my name is Azar Azarel Asarin, whichever is good. And I work with a nonprofit organization that partners with the CDFI Bank uh, for Southwest Community Fund. Right now, we primarily serve the Western Slope in Southern Colorado. Um, in, in northern New Mexico, but we're looking to expand. And one of the funds that I'm currently directing is our Rural Women-Led Business Fund. And this business fund is aimed to serve at, at least 51% plus um, women, female identifying or non-binary uh, business owners. And it includes a model of low interest, uh, low interest loans. So recognizing that capital is needed and also recognizing the capacity building is needed. So we, the way that our program works, it um, models um, mentorship and accelerator and ongoing workshops to, to really marry that capacity and that capital building. And I put my email in the chat. So I would love to get connected to anybody who wants to learn more about our work. And I do have a question, but I can go back to raise my hand and ask it later. No, 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 go, go ahead while you're speaking. Oh, definitely. So the question that I had is kind of through, through the case studies conversation and the, and the conversations that our state demographer, I've heard Elizabeth speak before. One of the things that sticks to me is sticks to me is that one of the one of the things that we're looking right now into is seeing how we can we can fund our youth entrepreneurs, and and one of the one of the conversations that have come up through listening tours and to into doing outreach to to that to um, those 15 to 19 year olds is that yes entrepreneurship is a path that we want to pursue but also really a, a need for those entry level jobs to to not just gain experience but also to gain income because as we talk about diversifying diversifying economies i, I really want to hear a couple of the panelists who ever want to hear the perspective in balancing um yes we need entrepreneurs but yes we also need to increase the amount of people spending money in our communities um if anybody would speak on that i would appreciate it This is Stefan. I, I, I'm impressed. I mean, the idea of, of focusing on youth entrepreneurs, I mean, they seem to take to that. It, um, the self-employment is, is something that uh, older, you know, is, is, is not necessarily natural for young folks, but the fact that you're introducing them to those op op opportunities is great. I mean, in terms of, I mean, these kind of, kind of initiatives often help with, you know, the buy local type movement, for instance, you know, buy from your local small businesses. Um, on Main Street, and that can actually that can actually be fairly effective um, in keeping the money in the community as opposed to having it leak out. Good, and and uh, and I'll also share resources we have here at CSU for the uh, we have an entrepreneurship program that does not have any age requirements, so we'll put that resource in the box as well. For now, um, Dr. Jim, we saw your question in the box, and we'll make sure we get the answer to you. But Emily, I think you had a question you wanted to share with the panel. Yes, thanks. Um, I wonder if, uh, I mean, your case studies were wonderful, but uh, without naming names, are there examples of rural communities who try to do all the wrong things and try to be something that they aren't or try to do something that a big city would do? And I just wondered if you could uh, talk a little bit about how you, how you or someone can provide technical assistance to rural communities to help them focus on what their best fit would be. Emily, I'll take a first stab at that. Uh, I think it's important to 
focus on the fact that 70% of economic development and new business development will come from startups within a community from grassroots efforts uh, in rural uh, communities. And so to your question, I think any community that is looking at uh, or putting primary emphasis on a business attraction retention program as opposed to a self-generating business growth uh, initiative uh, is probably misguided. I, I think that's a good point. And I think that's why we wanted to feature some of the OEDA professionals is I think one of their jobs, Emily, is to really help people find right fit um, approaches to economic development in rural areas. So hopefully they, you saw some example from other regions that might align with what you think. Um, Elizabeth Garner, I just saw that you were trying to speak probably in answer to one of the previous questions. So before I go on to the next question, um, please, please chime in. Um, no, I was just gonna talk kind of about uh, the youth population, um, but it might also leak into a little bit of what Emily was talking about. You know, one of the things with the fact that we're slowing down is really looking at how do we retain these 20 somethings. Uh, a lot of them leave communities, especially rural communities. But at the same time, we've got a lot of people aging into kind of retirement. So it's also looking at, are there some partnerships that people can look at in terms of succession planning of these older uh, workers that may be aging out, bring in some of these younger workers um, or younger, you know, and they don't even have to be workers yet. They can be in middle school, high school, get some of that experience. Because even if entrepreneurship is an ultimate goal, there is nothing better than getting your feet wet working um, in any job. I mean, I, um, you know, I, I won't gloat too much, but let's see, Burger King was one of my highlights of my career and, uh, you know, certainly prepared me in all sorts of ways that I never thought about at that point. But I think it's a good way to also think about how you really engage with that young population. Um, the only other thing that I would also add to Emily's comment in terms of what are people doing wrong, you know, I, I would say, you know, there's a lot of rights, there's a lot of wrongs, there's a lot of in-betweens, but it's important to, I think, understand the connections. And so like right now, so many people are focused on um, remote workers or trying to attract business professional service. And I just, I would always be careful on just jumping on a bandwagon without understanding the total implications. Because in a lot of areas, there's already a housing challenge and so you bring in a whole bunch of high wage earners that continues to stress in the housing situation. And so it's being able to make that connections ahead of time. So where you can say, all right, let's look at housing and, or you know, uh, remote workers and, so that it's, we don't continue to stress some of our already stressed systems. Great points. And I, I forgot to mention this. Um, Colin, I'm gonna go to you next. As you ask your question, if you're willing, like so many of our audience who's super engaged is doing, share what community or organization you're with so we have a little more context about you. Alan, do you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question next? Uh, sure, thanks Don for having me. I actually am, my name is Colin Berger. I'm in Glenwood Springs. I'm actually not within a community organization, but being from the West Slope, I'm always interested in how to um, <laughs> create a little bit of dynamism. My question would be for the for the panelists is how do you how do you bridge some skepticism gaps, right? I think that um, many of us are confronting like the increase and I hate to be the one to introduce it, but like pol polarization in communities or things like that. How do you bridge um, those gaps or, or kind of break down skepticism? Um, especially in places like you know Garfield County here where we are very much fueled by extractives. But you know, we we want to diversify away from that. Kat, I would love your perspective on that if you're willing to answer. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because it kind of goes together with what my answer would have been sort of for the for the prior um, question as well is is to not to try to find a way to not look at yourself in a vacuum. You know, part of the reason that we that we provided some of those case studies is because by sort of looking outside and reaching out to communities who maybe have gone through a similar thing, you see yourself, right? You can see mistakes that maybe have been made or successes that have been made. 
and and you can sort of see and adapt on that um, in terms of you know the the sort of the sort of division um, i'd say baby steps right start with the smallest lowest hanging fruit project that everybody can kind of get behind and find a short term success um, I think that's one of the biggest struggles that we have in rural Colorado is that, you know, consistency in, in leadership, because let's be honest, our elected leaders, you know, oftentimes we're all, they're business owners, right? They're, they're community partners, they're not professional politicians. They want to provide service, but they may not be in long enough to be able to maintain, you know, a, a long-term perspective. So, you know, continuously if you if you have a planning process you know like the one in in del norte um continuously basically responding to that and giving updates on that and adjusting where adjustments are needed but always always celebrating those successes um i think if you can find something small to celebrate that's usually a starting point anyone else want to address that before i move on to the next question Okay, Sheila, and then Paul, you're on deck. Sheila, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Thank you, Colin. Great, great question. Thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm Sheila Zuschek. I'm with Ponderosa Plains Farm in Elizabeth, Colorado. Um, I'm actually a board member with the Elbert County Agricultural Alliance, and uh, I manage the agritourism group. And I'm also a member of an informal group called the Elizabeth Area Art Gang. And we have an uh, some nationally renowned and some unappreciated but talented artists out here in our area. And I wonder, um, how do communities acquire certification as a certified Colorado uh, creative district? Uh, Sheila, I, I can kind of point you in the right direction. Uh, the Colorado Creative Industries uh, has a, an actual process you go through and it's an application process um, that they can help lead you through it. There's um, more people that apply for it than are granted, but uh, as we've seen tonight, you know, we I, I can't speak for them. I work with them on projects, but um, I know that there is a intentionality of, of hope that there will be more rural uh, districts. So I would suggest uh, literally going, and I, I don't have the website in front of me, but Colorado Creative Industries um, and pull that website up and there, there is a uh, um, information about uh, going through the creative districts uh, process. And Michael, Maggie did share that for you already. Oh, what great. I would love for you to follow up on is, tell us what you've seen as some of the wins for communities. If they go to the trouble of getting one of those established, tell us what that kind of means for the community. What does it help spur or grow or help them garner new resources? That would be interesting for me to hear even. Yeah, uh, well, one thing is uh, you are, you're a lot of technical assistance, basically. Uh, a lot of, um, you have someone to call and say, hey, I don't understand X, Y, or Z, you know, how can I do this better? And CCI has a huge network uh, in which they can uh, hook you up with the right person. I mean, it could even be me. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, there is a, I believe, a loan program that is once you're in the uh, actual district, you have access to that, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you also have um, uh, help with uh, giving baseline data. Uh, they have, um, they will set you up with uh, what they call CV suite, which is basically like the information I talked about this evening, uh, how many people are employed, how much revenue is coming in. Uh, you can uh, model that for your, your district. Uh, so that gives a way to explain um, the value uh, that the arts have for your community. Uh, that's just three things. There's also a great network. Maybe the most valuable thing is you have a direct connection with everyone else who's a creative district. And you can immediately call and get someone on the phone and again, you know, find out the answer to X, Y, or Z. It's, it's a wonderful program. And we're starting to see more and more states across the country adopt the program based on what Margaret Hunt and CCI has, has done with Colorado. Thanks so much for that additional context. Very helpful. Um, Paul, thank I you think very much. Were, yeah. Thank you, Sheila. Um, Paul, I think we had you next to ask your question. Please unmute yourself. Great. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for the conversation this evening. 
Um, I have a question. Uh, it's probably for uh, our economist on the panel, but um, is, has there been any studies about the impact of minimum wage uh, in terms of you know, how it will affect rural economies development? And then I'm curious if any of you are familiar with any conversations about a minimum wage differential between 16 to 20 year olds and 20 and up. Um, as somebody who employs a lot of young people and it's a first job for folks, uh, I feel like that's a very different demographic than somebody who is, you know, maybe just out of college or in their mid 20s working a minimum wage job in terms of basic needs. So I'm just kind of curious of um, that impact. Stefan, are you up for field in that question or do you want me to try to handle it? I can start, but I mean, I'd love, I mean, the, the, the CBO actually just put out, a, I mean, because the, this idea of this the $15 uh, an hour wage um, is 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 popular and is potentially going to be part of the new administration's tactic. But um, the basic upshot is that there, it will reduce poverty, um, no question. But it will also tend to, to cut some some jobs. Um, and so this different. And the problem is that the fifteen dollars is not a one size fits all kind of approach. I mean, the fact is that fifteen dollars in Denver is very different from fifteen dollars in the rest of in the rest of rural Colorado. So, I mean, that differential that you were talking about, Jim, is I think really a, an important potential piece of, of, of attracting youth into the labor force um, with decent paying jobs, at least. Um, um, so that, that, that's an interesting policy idea. Don, did you want to add to that? Well, just to share with you, Paul, this, this is probably one of the most divisive debates even among economists. There are very different opinions about what it will and will not do. Um, and uh, what, we, what we do know is that there, the supply effect is not gonna be as abrupt and smooth as, as people think. So part of it is that if you get more quote unquote livable wages, you have some households who are oversupplying to the labor market because they needed more than one job or needed more than one person working in the household to make ends meet. And so even though there's some concern about uh, contraction and less jobs to have, do you need as many jobs if the jobs that are there pay level wages? So I do think it's, it's interesting to think about what that looks like in the, the space of those new entrants into the job market without the context and expertise yet that they should be perhaps earning a livable wage versus those who um, are working jobs that are semi-skilled. And so I think I think what we're going to see is a, a minimum wage law that if passed is going to have lots of nuances to it, a lot of phasing in. And, you know, the other big debate that's really going to go alongside this is earned legalization for immigrants. We still have a lot of non-documented, many of them working in some of the industries we brought up tonight, including culinary arts. And so I think that is going to be, uh, be the other missing puzzle piece that we're going to have to think about. So we will probably see some of the most dramatic labor market policies and shifts we've seen and probably a couple of decades happen. And so it's gonna be an interesting experiment all at the same time we're trying to recover an economy who lost jobs, not just because of usual macroeconomic shocks, but because literally whole sectors had to shut down like Michael show, showed. So you see those roaring back at the same time you have minimum wage get phased in and earn legalization. All guesses are off about what the actual outcome is gonna be, but it's gonna keep us an economists very fully employed. Um, so sorry, we don't have any uh, uh, solid answers, but we'd be lying if we, we admitted anyone, even the most specialized people have those. But I hope that gives you some insights into what we're going to be watching and thinking about. Um, do we ha I kind of lost track if there was another hand up and any questions. We've had a very active chat box as well. Any, uh, anyone else since we kind of got caught up with speak with questions of anyone who wants to um, share anything, including things maybe they already put in the chat box. Uh, Stephanie, do you want to to bring to light what you're sharing in the chat box, or is that where you're more comfortable sharing your questions and resources? Housing kind of as coming up. Uh, I think Elizabeth, you've already tackled that a little bit, but. Um, I know you are someone who early on was trying to look at a new index for Colorado that, you know, we, we have a cost of living index that a lot of things, 
from public payments to um, wage increases are pegged to. And we've always known in Colorado that is such a multi-dimensional question because there should not be one cost of living increase for Colorado. There should be 22. Um, so I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about if DOLA is continuing to think about and look at how we look at affordability in a very, very place-specific context. I think that really kind of goes hand in hand with the housing discussion. Yeah, and I, um, I will say that I am not well versed in the whole housing and what they are looking at in, in projects, but Stephanie brings up, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges for rural Colorado is that just trying to get a, a house built um, is a challenge because the, the value of that house uh, isn't end up being, you know, the cost of it. So getting it built is the challenge. And so looking at these different uh, strategies, funding strategies to make available housing, because, you know, her region is exactly, you know, the challenge that we've got, you know, we've got an aging labor force, we need people to come and fill positions, but there's no housing available. And that's the case in a lot of places in the state. And I don't, I don't have any of the answers, um, but can only talk about that challenge that rural Colorado faces. So I'm sorry, I'm not very helpful. Can you hear me? This is Stephanie. Yes, we can. I'm sorry, my service is not very good right where I am right now. Um, so I hope you catch what I'm trying to say. The, the one of the challenges that definitely that we keep having is the fact that I'll give you an example. Grenada, Colorado, population 500 uh, or thereabouts. Um, we have a meat processing center that is looking to locate in our little town, um, going to bring 25 to 30 jobs but there is no housing available <laughs> for that. You know, there, a lot of them will come from Lamar and the surrounding areas to work, but there are some that want to actually bring their kids to school here. They want to locate here, but the housing is not there. And to make the, point, the case that, hey, it, it is necessary, you know, our, our data just, doesn't always support that. And so that was one of the reasons I was bringing that up is that that's not only Grenada, you know, that's experiencing this and we can make a very good case because we have that, that's that business looking to locate here, but in other areas, um, you know, you drive miles and miles to get to work because there's just not available housing where, where you're going to be working. So um, that, that was just my point is to make the case when the demographics does, don't always support it. It's just a big challenge for us in our area. And how, how to get around that? I don't know. <laughs> I'm hoping all of you can answer that for me. Well, but of course you, you want it because you just talked about children and youth and that counters the trend Elizabeth brought up earlier is gonna be the grand challenge for rural Colorado. Have you connected at all with your USDA Rural Development Office? Cause they do have rural housing programs. Of course, they'll never move fast enough or something that wants to open, of course, next year, but um, they're, they're the grand resource that often gets underutilized. Um, um, but the, the USDA Rural Development Programs are specifically for that problem of having housing come alongside industry growth. So have you connected with them at all yet? You know, I, I, uh, I do work with um, Division of Housing. I haven't worked... Um, recently with uh, USDA other than with our housing rehab. So if they already own it, it's great. We can work with them to actually rehab the, the house. It's new development that we're, we're just running into a, a brick wall on, on getting things developed. And I just saw Sammy George is on and she mentioned the same is happening with Los Animas. You know, they have the prison there. They have, you know, opportunities there that could bring people to just live in the community, but Again, that lack of housing, many of them travel, you know, over 50 miles to get to where they need to be to be able to work. So, yeah, uh, any opportunities, any help is greatly appreciated because this is every meeting I go to. What are we going to do about housing? 
and it, it's just everywhere. Well, it's but thank, thank you all for this conversation. We I truly appreciate it. It's been very enlightening with all of the um, information that's been shared tonight. I appreciate that. Yeah, and there are more resources in the, the, the box. If people didn't catch this when I put it in the chat box, we are gonna try to grab all of these great resources you're all sharing in addition to what our speakers already shared. And when you get a link to tonight's recording and resources, we'll, we'll try to share those so you don't have to sit there and write them down and capture them yourself. Um, because you know we're, we're, we're selfish here too. You guys are giving us ideas of where we need to go start thinking about additional research and programming as well, when we get asked these questions, we won't be caught flat-footed because you guys have already put in our ear, these are the things that are top of mind for you. Um, Azarella, it looks like you wanted to, oh, Kendall, I just saw yours. We'll have Kendall go first and then next, Azarella, again. But Kendall, do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, thank you, Don. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, I, I was just curious if any of our panelists could comment on uh, the role of the state itself, which seemed to be missing a little bit from this discussion, and in, in particular, if there are any recent developments coming from either uh, the governor or the state legislature related to some of, some of these more minute issues we've talked about. Like in, in particular, and I think this relates back to some of the comments on um, what women and minority-owned businesses, we know that you know, the state has some issues with tax policy and with tax expenditures in general, uh, and that's something that I, I, I do think rural com communities need to take into consideration that, you know, there are different ways to do <laughs> tax policy uh, and a number of other states and localities across the country are, are choosing to use tax expenditures in a way that do benefit rural communities and women and minority owned businesses. But I guess just beyond that, yeah, I'm, I'm curious if, if there's anything of note that the, the state itself is doing that anybody would like to comment on. Thank you. No, great question. Anyone? open to fielding that question from Kendall? At the national level, the PPP has just been just been changed to actually to actually advantage small operations. They're going to limit for the next two weeks PPP loans to companies with less than 20 employees, as well as um, what, for proprietors, you instead of using profits, which they don't usually have, but use gross revenue for um, for the basis for their PPP loan. So at the, at the national level, which trickles down to the state small business development centers, um, that, that's, but I don't know about the Colorado specifically. So can, somebody else maybe can pick that up. Well, specific to the food and agriculture sector, which is what I'm an ag economist, we track the most, there is going to, now it's gonna come from the federal level too, but the state level, there's already been talk about rebuilding infrastructure because of some of the supply chain disruptions. So perhaps even the meat processing plan we just heard about is perhaps um, a result of that. Um, we haven't thought of plugging in their ear how they're going to make that systematic and think about not just the investments in the new industries, but also the supporting community structure that comes around it. So of course, USDA rural development is one of our, our key resources. And I didn't realize Sally Clark, our state director was on the call, but she shared that resource in the chat box. But you know, the one thing they have started doing the last two years, which is at least starting to get to the root of the problem is they now have a workforce development program where any farm or food business who wants to hire and bring an apprentice alongside, they're cost sharing that to try to build the supply chain of workers that those same plants need as well, because that's not always um, clear that that's available. Um, but I certainly have not heard them talk about more systematically, again, whether the community services, hospitals, housing, um, education, um, planning for those rural areas is coming alongside that. So that is something we can certainly plug in the ears of our, our uh, uh, policymakers and people who can rethink some of that programming. So Kendall, really um, good question. Azarel, I think it's back to you and then I'll see who. Did you, you guys have been a very good audience. It's actually hard to kind of like track you guys, but you're doing great. So Azrael, I'll turn it over to you and I'll see if the chat box has more of a share. Definitely. And this is a question, I guess, for the economists on the panel and maybe Elizabeth, the demographer, can chime in. As, as you were discussing during the presentations, there was some of the highlights that I, that I kind of stuck to me with. Uh, the need for migration, and, and I know you were discussing more traditional state-to-state, city-to-city migration, but also the the increase in the the spending power being in the uh, millennial Hispanic population, 
And, and I'm curious if there has been any research or any up and coming research identified in if, if increasing policies that are more friendly to those who are undocumented, um, being able to access uh, resources to become entrepreneurs and to get more well-versed entrepreneurship, if, if that would have been a significant effect on positively impacting our population trends and our economy. Stefan, you want to try to field that? I think this is more Elizabeth's territory, huh? Well, it's a, it's a mix, I will tell you. So I'm going to talk about the demographic component of it. Um, certainly on the, on, you know, any policies, let's see, how do I state this? Um, so one of the things that we've seen recently is uh, definitely downward pressure on international migration. Um, Likewise, even um, illegal international migration, downward pressure on that end. Um, so certainly policies that are more friendly toward international migration uh, will increase opportunities for a labor force. And we will see, as I was talking about, you know, we've seen a lot of downward pressure on growth and we are gonna need the workers. Um, and then Stefan provided a lot of good information in terms of, you know, the the actual significant value add of international migrants in terms of entrepreneurship and labor force creativity, all of those things. So I do think um, that we will see that actually nationally uh, come in play uh, over the next uh, months, if not a uh, year in terms of that side, but maybe somebody from an economic point of view can also add. I mean, the, there's been a general trend downward in, in migration for, in, domestically, too. Um, uh, and so, um, and that, 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 I mean, I think Elizabeth pointed that out. And I mean, Colorado's been, you know, beginning to price itself out of the market. Um, in terms of policies, um, I'm not exactly sure how to answer that. Um, could you... Could, could you maybe ask the question again? Yeah, um, so my, my, I guess my question is if having uh, more opportunities for funding, for not, not funding and also just overall support for undocumented communities, um, oh. if that would, that would positively turn our economy, if we kind of, were able to foster some of that entrepreneurship in the in those communities that are traditionally marginalized and, and not able to access business development and, and funding capital and stuff to start a business. No, that's it's and, and Elizabeth pointed out what I what I mentioned is that foreign born are twice as likely to start their own businesses. And that's despite the fact that they face a, a lot of constraints in terms of bank loans. Um, venture capital, um, you know, I mean, basically a lot of these folks end up using credit cards and other sort of um, high, high price types of capital to, to, to innovate. So, um, you know, I think that in, in terms of the, you know, the, the, the federal position, which seems to be opening up to undocumented, um, that could be a real boon for entrepreneurship, given what we know about the foreign born and, and their, their tendency to start their own businesses. Well, I think, and I think the one interesting policy dynamic here is going to be, I think the way to get both sides of the aisle connected to the idea of earned legalization is going to be the potential win for the business community of an increased labor force. So the, the one interesting dynamic here might be, you actually might see because of the carrot that it represents in terms of depending on which sector perhaps to even work in with agriculture, probably getting the most preference. If you're willing to work in a sector of so many quarters, that might be your pathway to either legalization or more accelerated legalization. So oddly, that might counteract that usual force of seeing more entrepreneurship. So it's going to be really interesting to see if this is a short-term dynamic or a long-term dynamic where some re-enter the workforce to get the earned legalization, then pivot into once they have earned that, becoming entrepreneurial again, but again, then having all of the usual barriers float away because they'll have that status that they need to participate. So I think that's very much in place. And then I think I heard some of the programs that Kat and Greg shared tonight 
you know, this idea of, of new versions of apprenticeship and in incubators and stepping stones that if the main constraint is capital and um, having the right support network, I think you're gonna continue to see more incubation and apprenticeship programs that give people phased, phased um, pathways into developing their own businesses. And sometimes they call that economic gardening, but I think that actually also has a lot of potential for rural Colorado for a lot of the reasons we've heard about. You know, I'm going to add just a couple of additional points. You know, as well, there's been some challenges because like some dollars that come through the state are federal dollars, which are a lot more challenging sometimes to work with, especially on legal status. But with some Colorado dollars, there's uh, becoming some more flexibility. And I think the legislature as well as the governor is going to be looking at some programs really with the COVID recovery that are going to make those dollars uh, a little bit more flexible, especially based on legal status. So that's, I think, one positive that we're going to see. Second, um, kind of to get back to Kendall's question about what kind of resources are there statewide for uh, small or women-owned businesses is, and I'll make sure that this is going to be in the resource section later, that Department of Local Affairs has a bunch of dollars, not a bunch, has some money um, in their uh, division of local government. It's called Ready as well. So interesting uh, connection to this study, uh, but Rural Economic Development Initiative and it there's dollars available for small businesses. Likewise, I believe the governor, um, there's gonna be more dollars coming out with a stimulus package and the governor's looking at targeting, I believe a lot more towards small businesses as well as women minority owned. So I would keep your ears out for any of the new programs that probably will be coming out with just in a couple of months. And Dor Dorothea, that I, I saw both your comment in the chat box in your hand, so please, please share. Hi, my name is Dorothea Steinke and I'm on the board of a small nonprofit and we're mostly in the Denver metro area, Literacy Coalition of Colorado. We're a resource for the adult education providers, whether it's helping people get their GED or learn English as a foreign language. What you're talking about with entrepreneurs says to me, those people need ESL classes. If you want to see where those classes are currently available, as far as we know at this point, literacycolorado.org, the tab at the top for classes, and then drag down to ESL classes. They are few and far between in rural areas. There are some places doing a terrific job, Pueblo Library, Pikes Peak Library District, et cetera. Uh, Grand Junction has a good library connection there, but there are big, big gaps all over the state where there's nothing for people. And it's a chicken and egg situation. Um, but just to be aware that if you're talking about immigrants coming in, they need the programs and specifically to Fort Morgan. There was a wonderful program was at Fort Morgan Community College for community people. There has been for many years a, an ESL program at the Cargill plant sponsored by Cargill, but fund cuts, community college fund cuts, that whole program disappeared overnight. So adult education um, is lumped in with K-12 education at this point and has been for years because of the way the federal dollars for adult education come through. Not many school districts have adult education programs. There are a few, Montrose is one that comes to mind immediately. Many of them are standalone nonprofits and there are a few of them. And what we're trying to do is find them all. And we started this map three years ago and nobody before had tried to find all of the programs in the state. The, the um, Office of Adult Education Initiatives in the Department of Education has a map but that is only those programs that receive federal dollars. And the sad news there is that five years ago, there were 30 some programs that were getting federal dollars. Now it's 13. Yeah, and as we, we, we start wrapping up, if 
you if you have even the resource to the map of even if it needs to be updated to share again we would love to compile that in resources we share I, I this has been amazing you guys i've learned so much both from the panelists and from the audience um but i, I do feel like it's amazing we've kept this this many of you this long on an evening but we we do want to respect everyone's time hand it over to maggie with colorado humanities to have some parting comments but know that we will be back in touch. We so appreciated you participating tonight and being so engaged. And to the panelists, let's give them a virtual round of applause for the, the great content they put together. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Maggie. Well, definitely, let's all give them that round of applause. Uh, I'm on to thank Don and, and panelists for sharing so much knowledge, so many perspectives. I think this conversation could have gone on and on. Um, I want to thank all the audience members who asked your questions and brought us some insights and resources. Um, as Don said, we'll find ways to share all of this information. We hope you'll continue to have these conversations in your own communities, in your own regions and across regions. And we hope to make more of those opportunities for conversations available to all of you and and your friends and uh, neighbors who may not have been able to join us tonight. This program's recording will be posted on uh, Colorado Humanities Facebook and YouTube channels. And be sure to let your friends and contacts know that they can view it there. As um, Don said earlier in uh, the evening, mark your calendars for our next program, Loving the Land, on March 23rd. Uh, please visit coloradohumanities.org to learn more about that program and our other programs. Uh, thank you all for joining us. And Dawn, did you have anything in closing? Yes, thank you all for coming. We'll be in touch in probably more than one way, shape, or form. And uh, as our, our inaugural event with Colorado Humanities, CSU couldn't be happier with uh, the level of engagement. And I think we tapped a, a well of interest that there is in making sure Rural Colorado stays vibrant. So thank you for the roles you all play in making that true and making sure we're aware of all the issues we should stay on top of. It'll probably frame a lot of what we do in the in the year coming forward. So thank you for that. Yeah. And, thank and, and thanks for sticking with us. We'll be in touch. Yeah, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, stop there.